Well, thank you very much, everyone. King Solomon of Saudi Arabia just called to express his sincere condolences and give his sympathies to the families and friends of the warriors who were killed and wounded in the attack that took place just recently, just this morning, in Pensacola, Florida. The King said that the Saudi people are greatly angered by the barbaric actions of the shooter and that this person in no way, shape, or form represents the feelings of the Saudi people who love the American people so much. So uh, that was just given to me by the King of Saudi Arabia. And I can tell you it's a uh, horrible thing that took place. And we're getting to the bottom of it. Uh, all of the investigators are there now, and they're studying it very closely. And uh, terrible thing. And our condolences go to the families and uh, to everybody involved, including the wounded. We have some badly wounded people also. And we have to extend our condolences to them, and we'll be working with them all very closely. So I just wanted to let you know that was from King Solomon. And today we're here to talk to some of the very hardworking citizens who are benefiting from our historic record-setting campaign to eliminate job-killing regulations. I will tell you, the market is up 325 points today on great job numbers. The numbers have been phenomenal, actually. Some people said uh, so spot on, so, so good, that they've actually never seen anything like it. That's a long way from when people were rooting for a recession because they thought they could maybe win an election. <laughs> But we don't root for a recession. We root for success, and we're having tremendous success. I want to thank Vice President Mike Pence, who's here, right here. Mike, thank you. As well as Secretary Gene Scalia, Secretary Elaine Chow, Acting OMB Director Russ Vogt, and Acting Administrator Chris Pelkington. Thank you all very much for being here. Appreciate it. Appreciate it very much. It's been uh, an incredible period of time economically for our country, probably the best ever. Uh, we have the best uh, unemployment numbers in over 54 years. We have uh, the best numbers for African American. This came out today again African American, Hispanic, Asian American. Uh, the best numbers we've ever had. Numbers for women are at a record number. We think that it will probably, if it keeps going like this very shortly, be totally historic. Uh, but they're at numbers that nobody ever believed possible. Nobody would have believed it, frankly, uh, in the campaign. I would have never said it, but I felt we were going to do very well. That's despite the fact that we're paying interest to people that have their money in the bank and other countries are not, so they have a great competitive advantage. And yet we're by far, far and away, the most successful economy anywhere in the world. We're doing better than any other economy in the world. And, uh, you know, we've created many trillions of dollars of wealth since the election. Other countries have lost many trillions of dollars. We're by far the largest economy in the world, and that was going to change. For many years, they were saying that was going to change. We were going to go to number two uh, during this presidency. That was years ago, and uh, I guess that uh, the wrong president got elected from the standpoint that uh, there are a lot of people very unhappy about it. So they wish — they certainly think it was the wrong president. They would have rather had somebody else because they're not number one, we're number one, and we're, we're so far ahead uh, that uh, people can't even believe it. So we've had tremendous success. We've had it together. This has been a great group. The Cabinet members and the people in the administration have done a really good job. It was just reported that we added another 266,000 jobs in November. And we've also had very favorable uh, numbers outside of the 266th, including some of the past numbers have been corrected in a very positive way also. So we have 266,000 jobs plus. Uh, we've created 7 million jobs since my election. Unemployment is at the lowest rate, as I told you, in uh, many years. And in many ways, I think we can probably very soon say historically, a record 158 million Americans are now working. That's the largest number in the history of our country. We've never had 158 million people working. And we should be breaking the 160 million magic mark fairly soon. Uh, the stock market today, as you know, it's up 325. We've hit another record high. I believe that's 128 times, something like that. 
that we've broken the record, the all-time record for stock market highs. And think of that, about 128 times. And we've been here for less than three years, so it's uh, — and that, I can tell you, is a record. 2.5 million Americans have been lifted out of poverty, African-American, Hispanic-American, Asian-American poverties, poverty levels, in the positive sense, have hit record lows. It's something that nobody thought was going to be possible in a short period of time, either. So they've all hit record lows. Our regulatory reform efforts are delivering prosperity to forgotten men, women, and children of America. We are seeing a middle-class boom led by blue-collar jobs, and that's one of the things that's so great. The blue-collar workers, great workers of our country, they're really benefiting tremendously from what we've done with the tax cuts and all of the other things that we've done. And, and very big, I think, is the regulation cuts, because even before we were able to get the tax cuts so successfully from Congress, we started cutting regulations immediately, and that had a big impact. And that's why we went up so much between the election victory so you'd say, really, from November 9th, the day after the election, up until January 20th, the inauguration, the stock markets and jobs went — literally went through the roof. And if the election were lost, it would have gone right through the floor. It would have been a disaster. The soaring stock market is boosting pensions, 401ks, and college savings accounts at record levels. We've added $10 trillion in value to the economy, helping the small businesses that create two out of three new jobs. Nearly every single state has seen record numbers. Almost every state — I can tell you, every state I've been to in the last three months is having the best year they've ever had. And that's because of the federal policy. And uh, they're very thankful. The governors are very thankful. Uh, the senators are very thankful. They're all very thankful. So things have happened that nobody thought would be possible. But literally, every state I go to is setting a record for their state, individual states. And one of the states that just reported, and it's because of our actions, not because of their actions. This I can tell you, because their actions are very negative. Uh, California is doing much better than anyone anticipated because of what we've done at the federal level. So I'm very happy about that. Next year, we will continue our bold deregulatory campaign. We'll remove costly burdens to make cars safer and more affordable. Uh, I don't know if you know what's going on. We're in a dispute with California. California, in order to save a tiny amount of fuel, of which we have plenty — we have numbers that nobody ever would have believed possible — we're the largest energy producer now in the world, and we're an exporter of energy for the first time in our history, really. Uh, but uh, we can make cars much less expensive, uh, much better, much stronger, and about the same from an environmental standpoint, very close. But then when you realize that many old cars will be taken off the road because they don't want to get rid of them, because they don't want to buy the new cars, because, frankly, they don't work very well, that little — like this, you take that. Sometimes it's about that much gasoline. It's a difference between $3,500, extra computers put on the engines, and all of the other things that you have to do. But the cars are much safer. Our cars are much safer. They're much cheaper. They're much better. And the reason they're safer is because they can be heavier, because uh, right now the cars are made out of paper mache. And ours are actually — we allow steel content. <laughs> and so uh, people are getting very excited about it. We have some good support with the auto companies. The only ones that don't support are the car companies that want to be politically correct. Uh, but we'll end up in some litigation with California. But just remember, our cars are safer. And, and, and they are much safer, by the way. And they're better. They operate better. And in every way, we think it's uh, going to be terrific. We have a lot of support from the car industry. And you're talking about a saving of $3,500 on average per car. That's a tremendous saving. And one of the other things from an environmental standpoint, many of the old gas guzzlers are — that are spewing out bad things are going to be coming off the road. Cars that are 10 years old and older, people will be going to the new cars because the pricing is better. And the net result of uh, what happens environmentally is a very positive result.
because a lot of old cars are going to come off the road. They won't come off the road with the California standard, but they'll come off the road with our standard. So you have a better car for less money, and it'll be safer. We'll end the regulatory assault on franchise small businesses, which a lot of the people around the table want to do, because they're very, very strongly affected. We'll provide greater financial freedom and flexibility for U.S. truckers. Uh, the trucking industry has gotten Right, Elaine? Out of control. You might want to say a few words about that in a minute, but it's gotten out of control. And we're doing other things. The light bulb. Uh, they got rid of the uh, light bulb that people got used to. The new bulb is many times more expensive. And I hate to say it, it doesn't make you look as good. Of course, being a vain person, that's very important to me. <laughs> it's like, uh, it gives you an orange look. I don't want an orange look. <laughs> Has anyone noticed that? <laughs> so we'll have to change those bulbs at at least a couple of rooms where I am in the White House. <laughs> but we're going back to the uh, to double standard. We have a, a standard of the new bulbs, and we have we have the old bulbs, and they're already making the old bulbs. Many people were complaining that uh, the new bulbs were much much more expensive, many times in some cases more expensive. And uh, the other thing, they're considered a hazardous waste, that because it's a, largely a gas technology, when the bulb is disposed of, you're supposed to bring it to a hazardous waste site. I said, how many people do that? No, nobody does it. And, you know, that's a bad thing. So uh, you probably heard about it, you probably read about it, and uh, you'll be able to buy light bulbs that actually uh, are better lighting in the opinion of many, in, I tell you, in my opinion, and for a lot less money. And so we're doing that. But you'll also be able, if you want, you can buy the other bulbs also. And I'll tell you, even the bulb companies are very happy about that. But together, we're defending the American workers. We're using common sense. We have a situation where we're looking very strongly at sinks and showers and other elements of bathrooms where uh, you turn the faucet on in areas where there's tremendous amounts of water, where the water rushes out to sea because you could never handle it, and you don't get any water. You turn on the faucet, you don't get any water. They take a shower, and water comes dripping out. It's dripping out, very quietly dripping out. People are flushing toilets 10 times, 15 times, as opposed to once. They end up using more water. So EPA is looking at that very strongly, at my suggestion. Uh, you go into a new building or a new house or a new home, and they have standards on where you don't get water. You can't, you can't wash your hands, practically. There's so little water comes out of the faucet. And the end result is you leave the faucet on, and it takes you much longer to wash your hands. You end up using the same amount of water. So we're looking at, uh, very seriously, at opening up the standard. And uh, there may be some areas where we'll go the other route, desert areas. But for the most part, you have many states where they have so much water that it comes down. It's called rain, that they don't know, they don't know what to do with it. So we're going to be opening up that, I, I believe. And we're looking at uh, changing the standards very soon. And that's a little bit like the light bulb, where you get a bulb that's better for much less money. We go back, but you have the other alternative. And you'll keep the other alternative with sinks and showers, et cetera, too. But that's been a big problem. So a lot, a lot of the things we do are based on common sense. Somebody said, is that a conservative? Is it a liberal thing? Is it what is it? What are we doing? I said, it's a common sense thing. And so many, so many of the things that we do, it's based on common sense, like the car. Uh, the car will end up with that net tremendous saving environmentally. When you think of all the cars, the old cars that will come off the road, You'll end up with a very a better car, and you'll end up environmentally. It'll be ultimately much better. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Mike Pence, our great Vice President. And Mike, you might want to say a few words, and uh, very importantly, go around the table with a couple of the people you want to introduce. Okay. We will. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, uh, it's a great day in America. We cleared the threshold of 7 million jobs created. And I assured all these business leaders and owners around the table earlier, Mr. President, that they have a president who understands that while you've, you've advanced tax cuts and tax reform at a historic level, uh, unleashed American energy, fought the open markets, free and fair trade, and rolled back regulation at a historic level. 
that, that you, as someone who built a lifetime in a business and grew up in a family business, understand that it's, it's businesses that create those jobs. And, uh, and we really have a group around us that's done an incredible job being a part of that extraordinary economic boom that's underway. But I assured them uh, that uh, for all that we've accomplished is just what you consider to be a good start. Uh, and uh, today, uh, several of them have uh, welcomed the opportunity to share their stories, but particularly uh, cutting federal red tape has meant to their businesses and, and how we can continue to build the momentum in this economy through more regulatory reform. Uh, I'm gonna introduce all three of them first and then they can just go uh, at, uh, at, at their timing and yours. Um, Barb Smith is the president of Journey Steel, which was founded 10 years ago and based in Cincinnati. Ryan Newby is vice president of the Bank of Laverne in Laverne, Oklahoma. And Drew DeWalt uh, is co-founder of uh, Rumbix Incorporated, a field data capture company that's revolutionizing aspects of the construction industry and also a Navy veteran. And I'll also uh, encourage you to hear from Dana Weber, uh, whose uh, family business was started 50 years ago uh, by her dad. And uh, she told me she's worked there for 48 of those years growing up and uh, is a part of a burgeoning and, and growing uh, pipe business in this country that's benefited by the efforts that you've taken on steel. And so yeah. these are great job creators and I told all of them how grateful we were to have them here for what they're doing and how anxious you are to hear how we can continue to build the momentum in this booming economy. So, yes. Mark? Yes. So thank you very much, Mr. Yes. President, Vice President, for giving me this incredible opportunity to be at this session. So my name is Barb Smith, and I'm the president of Journey Steel. Journey Steel is a self-performing steel fabrication and erection company. We're headquartered in Cincinnati, Ohio. My partner and I established Journey in 2009, built on passion, integrity, and dependability. We provide on-time, safety-driven, in-budget projects to our clients while also impacting the community. We have a year-round paid pre-apprenticeship program that target inner city high school seniors. So upon their graduation, we get them started on their career in the construction industry. My company is certified 8A, WOSB, MBE, and on a state level, EDGE and DBE, which these programs are put in place to help small minority women-owned businesses to grow. However, some of the regulations that are in place really hinder that opportunity for us if I may share an analogy, I'm Dorothy. The ruby red slippers are the certifications that I have. And the agencies point me on the yellow brick road. I've made a lot of friends along the way. They've been very supportive on my journey to the Emerald City. And when I got to the Emerald City, those big doors closed in my face because of some of the regulations that told me to go back, jump through some wicked hoops, which I managed to do. Got back, the doors were then open only for me to find another set of regulations behind the curtain. So my ask of this administration would be remove those regulations, let us get to the man behind the curtain who knows the power and those ruby red slippers that they've given us to open those doors for contracts so that we can truly impact. Now did you write those regulations down? That you think are un I assume you think they're unnecessary. Because some they're regulation not, is needed. I won't say they're unnecessary. Like I said, great people in the SBA, I'll use that. As part of it, uh, like I said, they are tremendous. They know their job. Do you know the ones that Barbara's talking about? I'm going to my direct them. line and email, so we're going to talk about We're going to talk about that later. Yes. Right. Yes. yes, sir. And if we can do it, you do it. Yes, sir. Yes. So. And there's just simple. Um, with the regulations, with a new 8A firm, being small, minority, women-owned, some of the things that we need, the biggest thing we need is a mentor. And in order to get a mentor who has the past performances, who has the bonding capabilities, who knows how to work for the government, which is one of the biggest spends in the construction industry, as you know, you spend billions and billions of dollars. But for the small minority woman-owned business who can't get to that company that's already been there, the regulations are in place where these agencies can't give me a list, they can't help me find that mentor, and even though I may knock on the door, I may not get to the right person. So that's just a simple regulation that hopefully would be able to be removed because if we're able to get to the right people, understand that, get the mentors in place that help us grow so that we can hire more people, change the economy, get more people to work, 
that would truly benefit, which was what these programs, I believe, was established for to begin with, is to help the minority small businesses be able to access federal contracts. Okay, good. Thank you, Bob. Very thank you. Great. Thank you. That's great. Ryan. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, thank you for the opportunity and your time today. I uh, appreciate it very much. Uh, Ryan Newby from Laverne, Oklahoma, northwest part of the state, uh, represents a small community bank in the Oklahoma Panhandle. And I say small, we're 58 million in total assets, 26 million in loans. Um, a few po points that I wanted to hit on was uh, the reform and repeal of Dodd Frank. Uh, we, like a lot of other banks in Oklahoma, got out of the mortgage lending business uh, due to the compliance red tape that we were having to deal with. 40% uh, of the banks in Oklahoma got out of the mortgage lending business at that time. And uh, with your deregulation, we've been able to get back into that and serve our customers. Uh, right. We were sending them you know, 40, 50 miles down the road to competition. So uh, it's been a big plus for banks like us. Um, a couple other uh, points I'd like to make are um, probably don't seem like big things to other people, but longer exam cycles for uh, well capitalized banks, yeah. you know, 18 month exam yeah. cycles, which helps cut down on compliance costs. Uh, we don't have to deal with examiners as much. We can serve our customers. Um, and also the corporate tax rate being lowered to, uh, from 34% to 21% saves us thousands of dollars a year to reinvest in our community and uh, make more loans for our customers. So again, thank you thank for you, everything uh, you guys have been doing. Good job you're doing that. I've heard some good things. Great. Thank you very much. That's great. Drew. Thank you. Mr. President, it's an honor to be here today. Uh, my grandfather was a World War II Navy veteran and spent the rest of his career running a small business, a construction company. So I guess you could say I followed in his footsteps. I'm also a Navy veteran, got into construction afterwards, actually developing and building large infrastructure projects, and then started my own small business. It's a uh, technology company, providing technologies for construction companies to operate more efficiently. I really think until we started our business, Rumbix, uh, my co-founder is actually a Navy veteran as well. Right. Until we started our business, nobody had built technology and software solutions for the men and women actually building construction. You don't get it built in somebody's hands, uh, get put on it. So. That's what our business does to really drive efficiency in the construction industry. And through these experiences, I've gained a, a great appreciation for the construction industry, all the good that it does. But as you well know, with all your building completed, it's, uh, it can get pretty complicated, costly, and inefficient. And so I love the deregulation approach we're taking here. As part of my business, I get to go to construction companies' boots on the ground across the country. And I've seen the drag that over uh, overdue for a good luck regulation uh, has on the industry. That being said, none of the builders that I meet with and work with uh, have ever seen the industry booming as much as it has right now. They have the largest work backlogs that they've ever had, and the only thing constraining the industry right now is finding enough people to do the work. So if we can sidebar, drive more people, and encourage more people to join the trades, which is a lucrative individual business and can prop up this part of the economy, uh, that would be welcomed. But there's still more issues to be solved. Uh, you know, I think I see a lot of companies doing federal contracting work that have added costs to their business of specific software and overhead headcount just for compliance. No other economic result on the business other than making sure you're compliant and you're fine later. Too much. Um, and then I see good projects getting done and they're still not out of risk because I had a contractor tell me about six months after a job being completed, they got sued for payroll noncompliance. They had to fly somebody from the U.S. to Australia to dig through the garage of a former employee for a legal box looking for the right paperwork to verify so they didn't get sued. You've done enough building. I'm sure you've been in a similar situation. It's, it's crazy. These inefficiencies still exist, and I think there's just such a good opportunity. I think what I do on the technology front is, is important for taking a, uh, an industry that's trying to move forward actually to take that next step. But I think the regulation piece, candidly, is a bigger opportunity that everybody's championing around this table. So you can actually look for opportunities to remove duplicative regulations from the federal, state, and local level and actually drive even more efficiency because it's the second largest industry in the nation. And if you can put more juice in the tank there, you can get even better results. And yeah. I'd love to help any way I can, but I appreciate uh, you invited me That's here today great. to share my well, story. Thank you very much. Good job. Good job you're doing. You know, uh, we have a lot of things that we're working on. One of them is to build a road. It can take 22 years to get approvals. 
and we've got it way down now. We had uh, we have roads where they've been going for many, many. They've been going for decades. Elaine knows this better than anybody. And at the end of 20 years, right? <laughs> at the end of 20 years, you literally uh, you go for a vote and you get turned down. So they've been trying to get an approval for 20 years, and then they get turned down like three to two or something. And we've got that process down to four and a half years. It's going to be, I think it's going to be two years. We're going to try and get it down to almost one year. That doesn't mean a road or a highway doesn't get approved. But mm -hmm. if they don't get approved, it goes quickly. So they get rejected quickly. Right. But they also mostly will get approved quickly. And Elaine's doing a fantastic job in bringing that down. We've had so many, uh, so many uh, examples of roads that took 17, 18, 19 years to get approved. And by the time they get approved, they cost 50 times more, they have to do all sorts of turns to get out of certain areas from an environmental standpoint instead of being a straight and much safer road. Mm -hmm. So we've been able to do that. And I think uh, those people in the steel industry have been greatly helped by the tariffs because the tariffs made the steel industry. Uh, it's incredible what's happening, the money that's being spent on steel today. I don't think we would have had a steel industry. If I, if I didn't get elected, you wouldn't have a steel industry because ultimately the, every steel mill was closing. Uh, they were dumping steel at a level that nobody's ever seen before. And they were dumping it in order to really destroy our steel industry so that we had to buy from them. And now the steel industry, if you look at what's going on, the, uh, the industry is doing incredibly well. They're building a lot of extensions. They're building brand new plants where they never, you know this, Russell, they never built a new plant. I mean, they hadn't built one in years, and now they're building new plants all over the country. They're expanding existing plants all over the country. And the steel industry is doing great, and it'll start doing even better with what we're doing. So it's been very exciting, especially since the economy is now even stronger than at the beginning. And uh, I think what I'd like to do is ask Larry Cudler, the great Larry Cudler, to say a few words. The numbers came out today, the job numbers. And Mr. President, yes. if I may, just based on what you just said, uh, Dana Weber is in the steel industry. Okay, let's go. I hope and you back me up. Think she wanted to share I hope I get backed up here. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely going to back you up. I can tell you that, first of all, you're the first president in the 40 years plus I've been in this business that's actually stood up for manufacturing. And I want to say thank you. The tariffs and the trade policies that you have have made a huge difference for us and a big difference. We are investing at record levels we have over the last three years. We are paying profit sharing bonuses and wage increases at record levels over the last three years. And we are having co companies, customers come out of the woodwork that we didn't even know existed coming to us because to inquire and to buy steel from us. We make specialty steel tubing. So you have made a tremendous difference. Great, that's and that's great. on top of all the, the tax relief and the regulatory burdens that I just want to, as I said earlier, please keep doing what you're doing for at least five more years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love the word at least. The word. <laughs> <laughs> I like to hear that. Thank you, David. No, it's been a big difference in the steel industry. And many industries, but the steel industry in particular was, we weren't going to have a steel industry. And that's so unacceptable, even from a defense standpoint. I mean, can you imagine if we have to, if we need, if we need steel, and we have to go to another country to get steel? And that was what was happening. Everything was closing down and very unfairly, and done with purpose. I mean, these people were coming in with purpose, negative purpose. So uh, they're not too happy, but our people are very happy, and the industry is doing fantastically well. It'll soon be at numbers that will be almost like the old days and maybe like the old days. Larry Kudlow, uh, you also had good manufacturing numbers today. I noticed uh, 50,000 jobs or something created over a short period of time. And the previous administration said manufacturing, you need the magic wand. You know, we've all heard the statement, but they basically said it was a dead business, when in fact it's a, one of the most important sets of jobs I think you could have anywhere. Could you give a little discussion as to what took place today when they announced the numbers early in the morning? I'd be happy to. Thank you, sir. By the way, we're still running over 500,000 in manufacturing jobs. Uh, so that's a big plus. Just a couple of quick ones. The report today was plus 266,000 jobs for the month of November, but the prior two months were revised higher by 41,000. So actually, today's number is 307,000. After you and I spoke last night, I went back and cross-checked, and sure enough, this is the fourth straight month of upward revisions from the prior period, and that's a leading indicator of a strong economy. 
A uh, couple of other quickies on this, 3.5% unemployment rate, that's near the 50-year low. Since you've been president, the average working family, right, husband, wife, two kids, after inflation, after taxes, has gone up $5,000, that's take-home pay, $5,000. The prior two administrations were basically flat. And then part of this worker boom, this American worker boom theme. So since you've been president, the production workers are increasing their wages at a 3.7% annual rate. Okay, production workers, 3.7% annual increase. Their managers' wages are rising 1.6. So the folks on the line, mm -hmm. the folks wearing the blue collars or whatever, the folks getting their hands dirty, they are working so well, their wage gains are almost twice the gains of their own managers. You know what? I've never seen it before, and as you know, I've been around three or four centuries. Great this morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And they really did fantastic. Remember, what the easy numbers really to work with, aren't they? Those numbers were great. The sunny day, sir. Yeah, no, it's, it's very good. Really very good. Uh, Elaine, maybe you want to discuss a little bit about transportation and in particular the highway and the building of the highways and roads and everything that we're working on so hard? Well, this is a president that really cares about the uh, condition of our infrastructure. And we continue to want to work with the Congress on a bipartisan basis. We've always said that. Uh, as a down payment to the president's uh, proposal on infrastructure, the department spends about $70 billion every single year to address, to refurbish, rehabilitate bridges, roads, highways, and so we remain very focused on our uh, goal as the president has wanted. He's also asked us to look at the permitting process and how important that is to, I know several of you around this table and others, of course, who are in this business. So he's been a very strict taskmaster. Uh, he has asked that for every two new, every one new regulation, we've got to withdraw at least two. And I think the whole administration has done much better. Brooke mentioned, that for every one new regulation, about 7.5, seven and a half uh, regulations have been withdrawn. So this is a tremendous you know, lifting of the burden on people's backs, small businesses in particular. And I also want to mention one other thing that the president mentioned about uh, the Safe Vehicle Act. You know, when we have, we all care about the environment, but when cars cost too much, people don't trade in their cars. And when that happens and people keep older cars, that's actually unsafe. So our new fuel economy standard will be one of this administration's biggest legacies in terms of a deregulatory action. And it's gonna introduce and improve safety on top of that. Because also, cars that are too light are not safe. So, so Mr. You uh, President, on? you've yeah. also led the way on that. Thank you very much. And you're working on air traffic control. Yes, sir. And that's something that to me is important because we have a system that's obsolete and it's ridiculous. Uh, it's a ground-based system, which nobody can even imagine because it's a 40-year-old system. They've spent billions and billions and billions of dollars over the year trying to upgrade it when you can buy a new system, brand new, with the top of the line. Uh, there are basically four companies that are in that business, but you could buy a new system for less money than it costs to renovate little pieces of this old obsolete system. I've been in planes where the pilots don't even want to use our system. They use another country's system to land in New York City or to land in other parts of the country, like Oklahoma. But they'll use somebody <laughs> else's they'll use somebody else's system. Air traffic control is obsolete. And uh, we're working on a project where we make a deal to get a great system. And we'll, hopefully we can meet on that soon. With, maybe with your people, we'll talk about it, okay? May I ask yes, one more thing? Uh, the Vice President and you are both here, and you have a tremendous interest in commercial space. And six years ago, the U.S. was way behind all other countries. In the last three, two and a half years, under your leadership and the Vice President's leadership of the States Council, America is once again number one in commercial space launches. Yeah. 
number one, number one by far. So we've done very well with the space. Uh, Jean Scalia, you've done a good job in that first uh, short period of time, right? <laughs> Secretary of Labor. Do you want to just say what's going on? And I know you called me this morning to say how great the numbers are. Yeah, I called this right in the shop two months. I mean, uh, it's such a treat to be able to report these what numbers. Job he's done. <laughs> 422,000 jobs in the two months that I've been in the position. And I get to talk to the American people about these results. And, you know, this is cause and effect, right? It's cause and effect. The effect is unprecedented numbers. They're spectacular. And, and wages, I mean, that's so important. And wages at the lower level are going up more, as, as Larry was saying. And the effect and the cause, I mean, we know what it is, right? It's it's what we're here talking about. It's the tax cuts. It's the deregulation. And so it's cause and effect. And I bet you, if we went around the table, apart from wanting to deal with uh, regulations and keep at that, right? Apart from that, I bet that one of the biggest things on these folks' minds right now is is finding workers. Uh, that's a challenge to small business. And that's how strong our economy is. When you talk to business people, one of the biggest <coughs> worries they have is finding workers. And, and so we heard Michael was talking a little bit about helping with reentry. Barb, you were talking about apprenticeships. Those are things that, Mr. President, you're focusing on, the Vice President, too. So we're addressing that. But I, I mentioned it just to show how strong the economy is right now. And, you know, and again, that's, that's the effect of the things that you've been causing through these policies. Great job. Great job. So thank you very much, everybody. Very successful uh, period of time for our country. The most successful probably in the history of our country. We've never done anything like that. We've never had these unemployment numbers or employment numbers. Uh, and we're very happy about it. A lot of hard work. Thank you very much, everybody. Mr. Thank President, you. What can you tell us about the, uh, the, the shooter in the Pensacola? Well, that's is all there. being studied now. We'll have a full report on it very shortly. Is this, is this, could this be considered a terrorism act? We're not going to report on that yet, but we'll be talking about it very soon. They could, we have a lot of great people looking at it and interviewing people in depth, and it'll be a report, and the report will come out very soon. Thank all you all very much. Thank you.